I'm all about national treasures today. I've got scotch pies, Spanish pastries, and the good old British beetroot, all cooked right here in my kitchen. Hello and welcome to Pies and Puds, my one-man mission to celebrate Britain's comfort food. Here's what's coming up on the show today. On today's show, baking for kicks, the Scottish savoury that's become a fixture at football grounds across the country. It's traditional. Every game, you've got to have a pie. I bake my own version of the Scotch pie. It's like going back to almost medieval pie making. I banish those school day beetroot blues with the help of some beetroot lovers. I'm going to raise my glass <laughs> to the humble beetroot. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Cheers. They inspire me to make my sweet and spicy beetroot pie. Look at that. It's amazing stuff. And Spanish sensation Omar Aliboy makes a wonderful ensamada mayoquina, a typically Mallorcan pastry made for festivals and celebrations. It's like a tub of wall. <laughs> and I make my version of a lardy cake. So what you end up with is quite a robust loaf. And my guests get to join me in eating everything. No one likes a pie more than me. Well, so I thought until I discovered that the Scotch pie is the most popular savoury product in Scotland. And here's why. It's traditional. Every game, you've got to have a pie. What makes a good Scotch pie to me is plenty of meat, as long as it's not too greasy. You know, a good filling, lots of, you know, crust on the, the outside as well. It's just beautiful, quite fiery, toasty on the outside as well. Beautiful, it is. Can't whack it. The best way to eat a Scotch pie is the way I'm eating it just now. It's not too warm, it's just nice for eating. And I like brown sauce on it. Just right down the hatch. Break the crust off right down the hatch. So the footy fans love them. And although Scotland doesn't have a world champion footy team, sorry lads, it does have a world champion of Scotch pies, Airdrie Baker's JB Christie. So here we are in the shop. Um, as you can see, we make much more than pies, but proudly positioned at the front of the shop is our Scotch pies. And this year, our endeavours were rewarded with the World Scotch Pie Award. An accolade indeed. With any kind of pie, getting the pastry right is key. And Andrew's Bakery has perfected the art of Scotch pie crust. The dough really wants to be well developed so that you get this nice, silky dough that you're able to pull apart. And it's very workable and malleable. It's June's job to use a machine called a waddle that stamps out the pastry into cases. When the shell first comes off the waddle, it's too soft for us to use. Uh, and we find that, and as more bakers, most bakers will find, we get bellying and it collapses. We allow it to sit for three days to dry out, and we call it curing. Uh, and after the three days curing, we find that the shell is firm enough for us to then add the meat to. Uh, and we give a nice firm shell that gives the, the good contrast on the finished baked product, that you get a nice crispy shell with a nice moist meat filling. These pies are not blind baked. The cases are just left out to dry. That's why they're so crisp. And the meat itself, it's, you know, it's 90-odd it's percent beef. Now for the filling. How do they get that signature spicy flavour? We like to think that, that we're different and we're better than other people because of the then blend that we put into that meat of, of the spices that we use, which I won't give away, but the spices that we use give a slightly spicy scotch pie, which some people think it's got a bit of a kick to it, um, but most people enjoy it. Andrew's Bakery makes over 100 dozen pies fresh every day. That's 1,200 individual pies finished by hand. So that's them in the oven. Scottish flour, Scottish meat, local butcher, made on a table in a Scottish bakery by Scottish bakers and baked in a Scottish oven. This isn't just a pie, it's a national staple steeped in pride and tradition. Having shaped, filled and baked the pies, Andrew now has to feed 1,200 pie-hungry Scots. I wonder where you'll find them. 
We have a new customer in Albion Rovers. Um, first home game today, which we're supplying the pies to. Uh, it's a local derby against Clyde, uh, so hopefully lots of pie eating. Pie eating at football matches, quite a traditional thing. Father and son go along, watch a game of football, eat a scotch pie. He's got to get them out while they're still hot. And he's got another thing to do too. Yeah. Nice one, Andy. Now it's over to Sandra and Margaret to shift Andrew's pies, which doesn't look too difficult. Okay. That's good. Thanks, Sandra. Hi, it's a good pie here at the Rovers. But before half time is over, there's some bad news for the last fans in the queue. Scotch pies are all finished, they're all sold out. That was the best Scotch pie I've had at a football ground ever. There's nothing to beat a good Scotch pie. The home team are winning, and Andrew's had a result too. Have you sold all the pies today? They were sold just after half time. They were all sold? They were all no sold. Good. Everything, yeah. <laughs> good. They've all gone. Everyone's hungry, everyone's happy. And it's a win as well for the home team. So, good day all round. Andrew's Scotch pies are the real deal, and they're giving me inspiration to make my own historical version. Hello, Andrew. Those pies I saw look fantastic. Yeah. And so you are using hot water crust pastry as well, I we take use, it? We use hot water. Good reason for using hot water, because we like to help pre-gelatinise the starches yeah. in the flour, yeah. which helps give you the firm crust and the nice crispy crust that you're looking for. And then is the lid, is that dry or is that going to be a, almost a fresh no, dough going the, into it? The, the lid on the top of it is, is, a, is the same dough as, as the base, but it's, but it's a fresh dough made, made that day. Yeah. Uh, and what, what we do is we pin it very, very thinly. And it, I suppose it helps with the process, but it also helps with the texture of the finished product that we'll dust that with a coarse rice flour, mm. which helps with the heat of it as well. Oh, that's a nice idea. How long have you been doing this then? I mean, have you always been a baker? <laughs> I, I'm third generation baker. My father was a baker, my grandfather was a baker before me. My dad was a baker and my brother's a baker and three of my uncles are bakers. It's funny when we all got together, you know what it's like as bakers. Sometimes you, you're in work and you, you're talking about what you do. When you're outside work, you're talking about what you do. You, you can never, ever get away from that right. way of life. What I'm going to make is my version of a scotch pie. Now, I'm so, it's going to use a lot of, sort of old ingredients and it is quite tricky because, as you'd appreciate, I'm using a hot water crust pastry and I'm going to try and get it around that mould and I'm going to try and put the stuff in it and I'm going to try and put a lid on it and try and make it look like a scotch pie. So it's going to be... I might even get you to give me a hand, Andrew. Well... Hot water crust pastry is made by melting the lard into hot water, so the fats are absorbed into the flour. It makes the pastry really smooth and strong. Now I'm going to add this hot liquid to the flour. So initially, just get your fork in there, turn it round. I'm just getting the spoon in there at the moment, and I'm basically just trying to bring it all together into one single ball. What I'm going to try and do is just try and smooth it off a little bit. I've basically just brought it together at this stage. As it cools, it will solidify, because the lard wants to go back to being hard again. You can actually put it in the fridge and it'll instantly pretty much solidify. Do you know one of the things I miss about going is, is actually the camaraderie in the bakery. I miss that. I think it, it's... it's, it's um, I think bakers are slightly mad. I think you have to be to get up at that time in the morning. Now, that one is about right. Pick whatever you want to use to shape the pastry. I find a glass ramekin about right, but a jam jar will do. I'll tell you what, I'm going to run with that one. Get this in the fridge for about five minutes, chill it down slightly, and then I'll be able to use it. Over here, I have my mutton. Now, I'm using mutton rather than beef. And again, this goes, this dates right back. And I don't know whether this is Scottish or English. I think uh, the, the history is that the Scotch pie originally came from England, but obviously we then took it. Of course it, it does. But we then took it and perfected it. <laughs> <laughs> is what happened from there. Um, mutton originally, I think, was probably a cheaper meat, especially yeah. in the north of the country, uh, and, and was in favour. I mean, you, you speak to many old customers and they'll say to you, you know, the, the best thing they remember about a scotch pie is when they bite into it and the grease runs down their chin. Yeah. And, you know, from lamb or mutton, you, you would get that more. 
the flavour of mutton sort of went out of favour maybe about 45, 50 years ago and everyone wanted, preferred the taste of beef. Yeah, there almost... are still mutton pies about, but, but not so many. Yeah, there. not quite rare. I understand that. I'm just adding a little bit of lamb gravy to this. Again, just to soak it down a little bit. I've got some salt. And I've got some white pepper as well going in there. Also some mace. Again, one of those old spices that have been around for many, many years. And nutmeg. The last time I added nutmeg to a pie, it'd probably be a custard tart. You know the, um, mm -hmm. you know when you put the nutmeg just floated on the top? Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I'm just going to mix this together. Some spices and gravy add flavour. If you want to make beef scotch pies, it's exactly the same process, just adjust the seasonings a little bit. Then, if I get some paper on the outside, some string. Can I use your uh, finger there, Andre? <laughs> right there. Thank you. So you need two fully professional bakers in your kitchen and you'll be absolutely fine. Now, what I've got in there, it's given it that tension, which is going to give it that rigidity as well. Now, the lid itself will sit, sit right on the top of that. When you add the lid, tuck it down inside rather than on the top for that proper scotch pie look. So at this stage, you pop this pie in the oven, Again, 200 degrees centigrade for about 35, 40 minutes, and it'll be beautiful and golden brown. But to achieve that golden crisp on the outside, you crack an egg, a little bit of egg wash, and then brush the top of the pie like so, and that will make it shine and dance when it comes out of the oven. Now, I've got some cool ones here. That is absolutely perfect. And you can see all the juices, the fat, that's poured out around the outside. But these, it's like going back to almost medieval pie making. And there you have it. You've got, actually, I've seen pictures which are not too dissimilar to this. There you have your good old fashioned scotch pie. There's something old school about the look of these pies that really adds character. Andrew, I'm dying for you to try this one. Oh, so am I. I feel I need to be the size of Desperate Dan for that one, but yes. <laughs> We're going to have to wait a little bit longer, but I'm dying to see what it's going to taste like with that mutton in there as well. Mm -hmm. Still to come, I am inspired to make a beetroot pie after learning more about this colourful root vegetable. This is going to turn it bright pink, isn't it? It is. Like Barbie bread. And I make a gorgeously fruity lardy cake, perfect for sharing. Now it's time to step aside and hand over my kitchen to a passionate chef as he makes me a traditional Spanish pastry. One of the great things about Britain is that you can get authentic food from all around the world. I'm joined now by a Spanish chef, Omar Aliboy, who works in London and he loves pies and puds as much as me. Hola, Omar. <laughs> Hola. Now, all these cakes and puddings and pies and tarts look absolutely incredible. I know you're about to get involved with a serious dish. Yes. Now, I don't want to take any more of your time up. Please, take Let's over the kitchen. In. I'm going to sit down here. If you need me to do absolutely anything, let I, me know. I may ask. There's quite a lot of work. And uh, this is an ensaimada mallorquina. Maybe a bit, bit like an estrudel. OK. Yeah. OK? OK. Ensaimada mallorquina is a pastry dessert from Mallorca and is made to celebrate festive occasions. So I put two eggs, uh, the milk, uh, a bit of water here, yeah. the yeast, the flour, and the sugar. This is all that we need for the dough itself. Yes. I'm going to put it into this mixer. If I can make it work, these machines are always against us. It's important that you work it a lot. If you don't have a mixer, just work it with your own hands. But we need a lot of gluten to come through so it becomes a very elastic dough. That is one of the key elements of this recipe. No, it's just dawned on me, Omar. You're my Spanish counterpart. You're exactly the same as me. You're just <laughs> as passionate. 
So it just come with, well, just make different things. Yeah, I, I first started baking when I was just five. I, I was actually a baker before I became a chef. Mm. They see you've dropped down. This is what <laughs> happened. <laughs> oh, sorry, mate, you carry on. <laughs> you know, after this time, this is the texture that it has. It's but beautiful. You... It stretches, doesn't it? It's just very uh, stretchy. And uh, if you don't mind helping me take all this out, we're going to take, take okay. over the whole OK. Lot. Omar has brought a selection of Spanish pies and puds that I've never seen before. What's this one, then? This is the Roscón de Reyes. The, uh, Christmas in Spain lasts from the 24th of December mm. until the 6th of January. Yeah. And the 6th of January being the most important day, OK? okay. So this is a brioche type of cake with a triple fermentation and candied fruits on top. And so, moving on to this one, this looks quite important, actually. Yeah, the Tarta de Santiago. I mean, it, it comes again from Galicia, and it's from... Uh, it's in honour of the Saint Santiago, right, and it, okay. it's an almond tart. That's like akin to our Bakewell tart, but we don't have a saint all over the top of it. And this looks similar to a creme caramel. It does, and it's essentially the same. The only difference is that it's made with only egg yolks as opposed to the whole eggs. Okay. And uh, we are not using any milk or dairy. Right. It's basically an infused syrup of lemon cinnamon poured over the egg yolk. And what's, and that, one, what's that one called? Tocinillo de Cielo. It's uh, heaven's fat. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> the it is indeed. <laughs> OK. You, need, you said you need this space. If I move some no, of this okay. out of the way... I'm going to start by pouring a bit of olive oil over the table. Here we go. Time to get stuck in and help my Spanish counterpart to do some serious dough making. And I, if you don't mind helping me, we are going to get a bit messy. Okay. We need all this table right. with a very thin layer of oil. In this case, it's olive oil. You can use vegetable oil, but keeping things Spanish, you better use... A good Spanish oil. <laughs> Spanish olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, this dough, which is incredibly fine, OK? Yep. I'm going to put it in the middle and... We are going to shape it a bit like a rectangle first. Okay. okay. Nothing else. And if you can pass me that rolling pin. So we are going to put a bit of olive oil. And what we are going to do is just a stretch from the middle towards the outside parts. You can see it tends to come back to its natural position yeah. where it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we do this a couple of times until it responds to our demands. <laughs> Something I'm going to ask you, meanwhile I do this, is if you can work on that lard and the sobrasada. Sobrasada, what's this? That's uh, sort of like a chorizo pate. Oh, okay? it is, yeah. It's pork with a lot of fat, a lot of paprika, the pimenton, and a few other natural spices. I always get the dirty jobs. Come on. <laughs> so can you get this stuff in, in Britain easily? Uh, well, through the internet this day, you can get anything. Okay. But otherwise, you can buy a fresh chorizo sausage, yep. put some lard in, just Got chop you. it incredibly Got finely. What an incredible colour. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So uh, that's been worked on. And now what we are going to do, ideally, you leave it resting for a minute or two, yep. because dough like to be rest all the time. And we are going to start stretching this dough, OK? It's hard to believe that this dough will end up nearly twice the size as you see it now. If you do try this at home, don't worry about making a few holes. And now, there you have it. We are going to start spreading this mix. So okay. if you can do half of it and I yep. do the other half. There you have it. OK, that's why it needs to be sort of tempered. Yeah. Otherwise, you will, yeah, it won't be very easy to work with. OK. And you want it all the way down to the bottom or you leave, yep. leave a gap? No, 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 all the way. Completely covered. It's a, it's, it's a three centuries old recipe that is all over, but it's done in Mallorca. Now that we've done it's it... It's Mallorca, is it? Yeah, from oh. the islands. And now we are just going to roll it over itself and just keep going all the way until we have it. it I see what you mean. It is a bit strudel-like. It's got that look and feel of a strudel, but it's got a lot more, lot more strength to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, and this is a big one, OK? Yeah. You can do as small as you want, and, uh, and with the feelings that you want, we are doing a savoury one, even though that the dough 
had, uh, had some sugar. And what we are going to do is we're going to start shaking this dough. So if you take that from that end yep. and me from this one. It's like a tug of war. We, <laughs> we start stretching it. Let's see how long we go. There, around, what well, is that... it? Two and a half meters? Yeah, at least, well, yeah. Ma much taller than you and me, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so this is good enough. OK. okay? And now we are just going to put it in a baking tray. So we would start just on the middle, OK? So now we are just going to flip it over itself and yeah. turn it around like an endless spiral. Yes. Spread it out. Spread yeah. it out, OK? OK. And we will leave this fermenting for 24 hours. Now, I know over there you've got one that looks as though it has been going. I'm just going to wash my hands quickly, I seem yeah. covered. This is ready to go into the oven. It doesn't need egg wash, it doesn't need anything. Okay. So this goes... Well, that'll grow even more in the oven anyway, won't it? It's going it's to balloon I, up I, If you leave it there, it will continue growing, naturally. This goes into the oven at 200 degrees for around 15, 18 minutes, okay. depending on the oven. OK. But we have one that we've already done. OK. That it's over here, which has been cooling down a bit. Wow. Yes. That looks incredible. Okay, that's the natural colour. Don't feel it's burn or nothing at all. Oh, and yeah. actually, take a look. It's a bit crispy. It's beautiful. Well, that's perfect, though, isn't it? Yeah. That crispiness inside. And even below it. Take a look below, because it's quite important. Wow. The yeah. baking below as well. No, it's not just about the, the look above it. Now we're going to put a bit more icing sugar on the top. Okay. But that makes it all very, very delicious. Not too much. That looks fantastic. So what's the name of this dish again? Ensaimada Mallorquina con sobrasada. <laughs> He's just made that? Yes. Fantastic. Omar's Mallorcan pastry looks and smells extraordinary. I can't wait to try it later when we sit down together and enjoy tasting all our hard work. Do you remember the beetroot we got at school? Overcooked, pickled and soaked in vinegar and, frankly, pretty horrible. It was enough to put you off this stuff for life. Or so I thought. This is Clifton in Bristol, and I've been invited to something called a beetroot supper club. I'm slightly unsure on whether to turn up with wine or not, but I decide beetroot is a safe bet. Tom runs one of the area's best veg shops. Obviously, that's what I affiliate. When I think of beetroot, I think of that. Yeah. But I've just seen this. Yeah, there's a lot, lot more to it, isn't there? You've got the golden beetroot, and you've got the candy beetroot. It looks like it's out of a candy store, isn't it? It does. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, that's where I got its name. But um, they've been growing this for years in this country. I'd say the, uh, the, the golden is more sweet, mm. and the candy's a little bit more earthy. Still super good for you. And also a good addition to salad. And your roast dinners, have it with anything. Lovely. Nice day, Thanks very much indeed. Thank Bye -bye. you. Beetroot bagged, I'm ready for anything, especially a beetroot supper club. Who knows, I might even pick up some new uses for beetroot I've never dreamt of. Wow, well, look beetroot. at those beauties, they're enormous. I know, they're massive, Absolutely aren't they? Absolutely enormous. So, are you a beetroot, a real beetroot enthusiast? Yeah, I really, really love beetroot. I mean, I think, I think a lot of people were put off beetroot perhaps at school when it came, like, really over-vinegared and it was so sort of strong. Oh, yeah, Do you? <laughs> so, I kind of like it, but, you know, on its own, it's a beautiful thing. It's so sort of sweet and earthy and it's fantastic. My host, Genevieve, has planned an unlikely menu of beetroot jellies, beetroot dalmadas and even beetroot bread. She has all the baking to do before her four guests arrive. Beetroot jellies is first on the list, with raspberries, pomegranates and gelatin. That'll do it. OK. I'm just going to pop that in, a, in the pan with a tiny bit of sugar, just 50 ml. That's not a tiny bit yeah, of sugar. A tiny bit of sugar is half a teaspoon. <laughs> That's about That's, six tablespoons. That was 50 ml of sugar. Which is four and a half tablespoons. I just thought I'd drop, drop a few raspberries in the bottom. OK, so it's strained through. And literally, you're just going to pour it all I'm into the... I'm just going to pour it into the glasses and the raspberries will float to the top. 
As the jelly set, we tackle Adalmades. Rather than traditional vine leaves, Genevieve is using, surprise, surprise, beetroot leaves. I love Dalmades, and I'm really not sure about this. As the beetroot Dalmades steam, Genevieve drags me into uncharted beetroot territory. I'm a bit nervous about this, but I'm going to make some beetroot bread. So I hope you're going to be kind to me. You're making beetroot bread. <laughs> I'm going to make beetroot bread. How yeah. are you going to go about that? So I am going to, instead of using water, the, the bulk of the liquid is going to be, again, raw beetroot juice. So it's going to be a really lovely, amazing pink colour. Genevieve is one brave lady making experimental breads in front of me. Strong What's this? bread flour, dry juice. Why do you use this stuff? Dry to use the instant stuff, it's far easier. You have the powder. Yeah, that's just what I always use. I'm going to put a tiny bit of sugar in to get the yeast going. Okay. Just so, yeah, that, that, that's too much. It's, it's too all right, much. It's too much. Teaspoon. If I'm going to take some out, I don't want that. This is going to turn it bright pink, isn't it? It is. Like Barbie bread. Yeah, Barbie bread. Woohoo! Okay. I think that'll do. That'll probably be enough. Whack in the juice. Whack in the yeast. And you're going to need this now as well. Yeah, I am, yeah. If I'm going to add anything to this story. Go on, show me. Bit of oil. You'd never use flour when, you, when you're dealing with. Uh, Dough, because it keeps the dough really moist. It dries and it. you'll find it cleans your hands yeah. at the same time. I did try and step back, but I'm a baker and I just can't keep my hands off the dough. Yeah. It's getting sort of smoother, isn't it? And stretchy, you can see it changing. After it's proved for an hour, Genevieve decides it's time to shape her, well, whatever it is. I've worked with all types of dough in my time, but never one this pink. But I guess what really matters is the taste. We'll see. I actually think it's more styleable substances. I can't see the beetroot flavour coming through in this. No, it's, I mean, it doesn't come through really strongly because it's quite a subtle flavour. But yeah. I think you can definitely taste it a bit. And I think half of the pleasure of eating comes from what it looks like to start with. So you kind of go, wow, that, that looks great. Fascinating stuff. We're using beetroot, we're using the jelly, we're using, the, we're using it inside the bread to create a loaf. Lots of things going on, but is it the beetroot? Is it the beetroot? Are we going to taste the beetroot? I know what beetroot tastes like. Is it going to come through in those foods? More importantly, what's everybody else going to bring? Fingers crossed. The guests are here and it's time for the beetroot feast to commence. Let's pink up this party. It's colourful, isn't it? Genevieve's beetroot devotees have brought some very creative uses for beetroot, including beetroot and chorizo sausage rolls, beetroot bhajis, and even, get this, a beetroot tart tata. Genevieve and her guests are obviously all talented cooks. It's their devotion to beetroot that's a question here, especially with the bread. The beetroot going into that bread has made a difference to the nutritional quality of that bread. Taste-wise, it tastes like a bread. If you close your eyes and eat it, you wouldn't know what it is. It tastes like a, a good bread, and is it? It's a lovely bread. It's a great texture. It's a great look. I think that's a success. Whether the flavour comes through or not is almost immaterial. Genevieve's beetroot leaf dalmadas are next. <laughs> what do you think of those, Paul? It's dalmadas. Away, though, eh? I think it's great. It tastes good. It, it bites. There's no tear. There's no rubber and rubbiness at all. It just tender. it melts. Yeah, yeah. it melts. Yeah. I've changed my mind on the beetroot, and there's still the jelly to come. <laughs> you know what? I'm actually quite impressed with the main course, but beetroot desserts. Hmm. It's delicious. <laughs> jelly. I've definitely got a bit of beetroot going on. Quite earthy. Soil-like, almost. But not in a bad way, if that's at all possible. Oh, thanks. Well, overall, 
I came here with uh, the idea that beetroot is a one-trick pony. However, <laughs> having been here today with um, you strange people <laughs> that play with beetroot and create dishes which are, let's be honest, magical. You've got some big, big flavours going on in all the dishes. All I can say is, I'm going to raise my glass <laughs> to the humble beetroot. <laughs> Cheers. 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 So how have you got on with beetroot since? You've yeah, not bad. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Well, I don't eat it every day, but I, several times a week. I definitely. think you do. I don't. I'd be purple otherwise. Well, you see, the thing <laughs> is, I was really shocked about the diversity yeah. that you know, they came up with. I thought that generally beetroot has been sort of... It's that sort of malign veg that no one tries to use. Or if they're going to have it, they have it like that. In a and salad. they have it in a salad with yeah. salad cream. Yeah. And I was one of those people. And to a large degree, still am. Yeah. I need to experiment a bit more, but today I'm going to make a beetroot pie. I'm not going to make some crazy beetroot coloured pastry, just a normal sweet short crust with a squeeze of lemon and butter. So you crush it in the flour as quickly as possible, trying to avoid too much liquid at this stage. What was the lemon juice for again? The lemon juice helps break down the gluten, the protein in the flour, oh, so... To make it more tender. To make it so it breaks easy and crumbles, yeah. because what happens is if you don't put it in, and you can get away with not putting it in, to be honest, um, basically what will happen is it becomes a little bit too gelatinous, yeah. and so it can have that slightly rubbiness to yeah. it. I mean, it can impart flavour, depends on how much you put in. If you put a lot in, then sure... And you... is that the acid in it that does that, that, yeah. that breaks it? Yeah, yeah, it's the acid that breaks yeah. it down. I'm just going to pop that on the bench, get a little bit of flour, on there, coat it in the flour, and basically work this flour until it's nice and smooth. Now, that takes literally 10, 20 seconds. Then you leave it in the fridge for about 10, 15 minutes, and it just solidifies. The butter then solidifies, it'll be good and more malleable. It's just easier to roll out. That's the only reason why it goes back in the fridge. I've got my rolling pin. Three rolls, that was my lucky one. And then roll it out, again, from the middle up and the middle down. Now, place it in there, fold in all the way around, fold over the lip slightly. Then you get your baking beans ready, piece of silicon paper inside, and force these down to make sure they get right into the corners. Do you trim it afterwards? You don't trim it now? No, I'll trim it afterwards because you can get still some, get some shrinkage back in the oven. So at this stage, that goes into the oven about 200 for about 15 minutes and it comes out golden brown. To make the filling for the pie, I blitz up some cooked beetroot, use the ones in natural juice, not vinegar, and some double cream. Look at that. It's amazing stuff. I mean, it's beautiful, actually. It's a lovely colour. I'm happy with that. Now, over here, I've got two eggs which is the other part of the filling. Two eggs straight in there, and I've got some dark muscovado sugar straight in there. I, can't th I think that maltiness that comes from this is going to help this as well. It's got that depth of flavour that could blend, could work quite How well with it. How much sugar have you got in there? That looks like quite a lot, doesn't it? It is quite so a lot. It is quite it a really lot. It really is a sweet, it's a sort of dessert pie. Yes. This one. I think it's to enhance it, but I could have gone down the, the mm. caster sugar route. Mm and just kept it white, but I think it needs some... Bit of toffee flavour. A little bit of punch in there as well, you know? And to add to that punch, actually, I'm going to add some ginger. There's a little bit of ginger in there. Again, the ginger with the beetroot mm. should work. And I've got some cinnamon as well. Well, these are sort of things that you generally work with. Yeah, I mean, I really... I've got a real passion for spice, and I, I beat me with spice. is a brilliant thing. Absolutely. Yeah, savoury or sweet, you know. It's got... I think it's got such an edginess to beetroot. I think it could take a lot of flavours, actually. I mean, I'm going to add the zest of... a little bit of zest of lemon in there as well. And, again, it lifted up, I think, lemon in any dish is a huge winner for me. It just enhances flavour somehow, yeah. doesn't it, lemon? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I combine my beetroot puree with a sweet, sugary egg mixture to complete the filling for my pie. So that's your filling. There's my tart shell. And basically, you fill that up. 
It almost looks like it's got coconut on, doesn't it? Is that, that's the cream, presumably, yeah. is just separated, and when yeah. it heats, that'll all go in. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Again, that is all of it inside there. Give it a little bit of a shake. Now, that needs to go back in the oven at 150 for about 35 minutes until it's cooked and it'll set almost like a jelly. And when it does come out, that is precisely Please. how it comes out. Yeah. I mean, it's something which... It's not going to shock the world the way it looks, but I bet you it'll rock the world when you come to eat it. I think my creamy beetroot pie, spiced up with the ginger, has blown away those memories of soggy school dinner veg. But we're going to have to wait, Genevieve, to try it a little <laughs> bit later. <laughs> okay. Earlier, Spanish chef Omar Alaboy made his ensamada, a Mallorcan dough-based recipe which he flavoured with chorizo and sugar. It's a, it's, it's a three centuries old recipe that is all over, but it's done in Mallorca. Now it's time for me to get my hands on some dough and create something special for him. Well, Omar has shown me his Spanish recipe with a twist. Now I'm going to add a twist of my own. Now, this is based on a lardy cake. Now, a lardy cake is, is a very ancient thing. It's been around for many, many years. Now, the main ingredients to a lardy cake are the butter, the, sh the salt, the yeast, and I'm using something slightly different because I'm using the dried stuff, and then I've got water. Now, I'm not going to go into the dough making at this stage. Basically, you put everything in, put the water in, mix it around, and then knead it. Now, once you've kneaded it and it's nice and smooth and elastic, pop it back in a bowl and leave it for a good hour, two hours, overnight preferably, and it'll be nice and fermented. Now, I've got a dough here that has fermented. Now, if I break this open now, it's beautiful. It smells fermented. It's perfect. You smell that? Oh, good. It's gorgeous. It's nice and stretchy as well. It's a good, strong flour, which I'm going to stretch out. I'm tempted to go... <laughs> and just take it out there and take it over to the far wall. Like right? a carpet. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes. been very worked on, too, I can see. Yes. Very yeah, it has. fine. It is. It's something which... Um, it's quite a strong dough, this one. It was mixed very well as well, so it should be perfect for this. Now, a lardy cake normally is layered with, with lard, with mixed fruits and with sugar. Now, what I'm going to do is something slightly different, so it's going to be a lardy pie. So your dough's laid out, you get your lard, and basically just drop bits in it all the way along, smothering the, the dough. You need to take it about two-thirds of the way up. The next thing to do is get your sugar. I'm using soft brown sugar all over the top. And again, it's quite sweet, and it'll bake and caramelise quite easy in the oven as well. Are you going to roll it too? I am going to roll it. Oh, fold, good. fold and roll, fold and roll. <laughs> So, again, once you spread it out all over the place, then you use your fruit and you've got mixed peel in there, you've got raisins in there, you've got sultanas. Tip all that in there. It's a very rich recipe, this one. It dates back a long time, actually, lardy cake. Probably about 200 years. With the lardy cake, use proper lard. Don't be tempted with butter. It just won't be the same. Uh, answer me to something in Spain. Just in the north of Spain, we use butter because there was no dairies in yep. the rest of the country, so yeah, we yeah. always use lard. It, it was the same here in exactly England? Exactly the same here, especially during the war. You know, when the war was on, the problem was there was just no butter. So lard was the only thing that people could get. So a lot of rec old recipes have got lard in them. It wasn't until the 1950s, 1960s that people said, hang on a minute, we don't have to use lard anymore, we've got butter. So butter was then put inside the dough. Yeah. So I've covered two-thirds of it, a bit like you do a croissant. And then you fold it over, push that down, and again, flip that over. So you, have a, you have a now have an envelope of three layers with all the ingredients inside. Now, what I'm going to do is just roll that out again using the rolling pin. Yeah. A little bit of flour. So at the moment, I'm using flour. I mean, you, can, you could use olive oil, but I think for something like this, it's got a lot of fat inside this one as well. Mm. And it's gonna, what I'm going to do to it is something slightly different. If I use oil, I'd have a problem with it when I cut it. Oh, definitely. I mean, e each thing has its own purpose. And, yeah, uh... exactly, exactly. So what I'm going to do now at this stage is actually roll it this way. So I turn it round, 
flatten it down, tack it to the bench a little bit, get the top, roll it up like so. So what you've done is just added another layer, really, of dough all the way down. I do find it fascinating that although this recipe comes from Britain, not Mallorca, it's similar to Omar's ensamada. Try and take it quite thin, turn it this way, and then you get a blade. Now, it's based on something like a cron, which is a French-style loaf. Cut it right down the middle. Well, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Cut it right down the middle and open it up. You can see all the layers. Now you can see all the layers, all the way in the, the, the lard, the fruit and the sugar. And if you turn it away from each other, so they're almost back to back, that's it. And then, basically, you twist the opposite way. So you twist it all the way. And then you fold it around, tuck it together, and then all you do is get your tin, which again I've lined with lard, pop it in there, leave that to grow near the top, and then bake it off. Bake it off at 200 for about 25 to 30 minutes, and it'll be beautiful and golden in colour. These two things that we've done are incredibly much easier than a croissant. <laughs> <laughs> it is. No, it's absolutely true. So what you end up with is quite a robust loaf. And it looks like that. You can see all the discoloration where it's gone in the oven. This is all the caramel like, where it's burned, basically, where the fat's come out and the sugar's come out. And you end up with a very old loaf with a very modern touch. Now, we can't eat this at the moment. We're going to have to wait a little bit, and we'll try it very soon. Hopefully. My fruity lardy cake is best served warm and shared. Put the kettle on and get stuck in. After a busy day in the kitchen, there's nothing better than sitting down to eat with my guests who help me create today's dishes. The best thing will be sharing, I think. <laughs> First up, we have my traditional mutton version of the scotch pie, which I'm serving to Andrew, the world scotch pie champion. You've got the spices right. You know, you need, you need to have them quite high in there so that it blends with it the lifts whole thing. Up against them. It has a lot of depth of flavour. You said that it was mutton, mm. and, uh, and and you can taste. It takes quite a lot. Omar's ensamada is beautifully delicate. This um, ensamada is uh, beautiful. The flavour's going through it. Mm. It's that bittersweet as well, isn't it? At last, Genevieve can get a daily fix of beetroot from my pie. You can still sort of see the colour, can't you, of the beetroot? You can, actually. The, the spices really lift it, don't they? Mm. Mm. Fabulous. Oh, yeah. That's a really good job. And my layered lardy cake seems to go down well, too. Hello, everyone. Well done. <laughs> great food, great conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. You can't go wrong, can you? Good food. I've had another great day in the kitchen, and it's wonderful to cap it all, sharing all this hearty food. That's it for today, but I hope you'll join me again next time on Pies and Puts. Do you want some of this? Yeah.